All right, this is News Desk, and a very warm welcome to you. With Ghana being, with Ghana's first Ebola treatment center ready, government says the construction of an incident depression center which would help deal with Ebola instantly will start in the next few days. It also says that works on uh, the, the treatment centers in Kumasi and Tamale are progressing steady as that of Tema is complete. Chief of Staff Prosper Bani says government is currently implementing some measures which will make it difficult for the deadly disease to enter Ghana. While government is hopeful the spread of the disease on the continent will soon end, Prosper Bani is however asking the United Nations not to only concentrate on nations battling the Ebola disease but also shift attention to non-affected countries so it doesn't spread there. He was speaking at a short ceremony here uh, in Accra where government donated thousands of bags of rice including 300 boxes of milk, cocoa products and cooking oils to each of the three affected countries. <laughs> We apologize for the terrible audio, but that's from amateur film, I should uh, let you know as well. But is this reason enough for us to take on the, or consider the risk of hosting the Africa Cup of Nations should Morocco withdraw as host? Let's find out from our medical team uh, what they think about it. Dr. Frank Srebo is General Secretary for the Ghana Medical Association. Dr. Srebo, you're welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Well, what would be your response to the question I just posed? Are we ready as a country to take on the risk of hosting the Africa Cup of Nations should Morocco withdraw? Um, thank you very much and um, greetings to you and your listeners. Uh, mm. In actual fact, it is quite interesting and, uh, that Morocco, with all their resources, after they have spent so much um, resources and energy trying to put into place um, infrastructure and everything that goes with hosting the population, we decide that because of Ebola, they are not going to host the tournament anymore. And then Ghana, I don't know, and I'm not sure, I hear are considering um, is considering um, hosting the tournament. Um, I think it's a very dangerous thing. It's something that we should not go any close to trying to host it because the issue is that Ebola is not like any other disease that we, we can easily um, treat every day. And as we all know, it's very contagious, it's very deadly, and the mortality rate ranges between 50 to 70 percent. That means that if 10 people are affected, five to seven of them are more likely to die. And if you look at the way countries like United States, all their resources, they are taking this is very serious. And uh, we are trying to deal with it. That, that is very, very interesting. Mm. You, as we all know, the incubation period of this is about two days, 21 days. That means that a lot of people can come in with all your screenings and everything. They can come in healthy, and then when they are in the country, they can develop the disease. So opening up your doors for Africa, and we know that at least three countries are hugely affected. And it is possible that we can have these individuals who work in healthy and later within the three weeks of the tournament may develop the signs and symptoms of Ebola and then we will need to follow up. Can you imagine if this man or person who probably comes into the country has gone to a stadium full of people and we need to track and follow up every single individual who was there in the stadium? Can you imagine? So it's, it's something that I don't think government... But, 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 but government has been putting in efforts to make it impossible for it, the disease to enter the country. We've got to the screening uh, process. Uh, we, we also hear recently that uh, our first treatment center is ready. Perhaps we can take on the risk because we, we have put these measures in place. 
let me let me let me let me be frank with you. Mm. The screening and all the things that we, we are talking about is, is just to pick up people who are sick and coming in. Those who are healthy and coming in and we still have the virus and have not started showing signs of symptoms, you can't pick it up. That is the reason why Duncan could travel from Liberia, the United States, and enter the country before he exhibits his signs and symptoms, and that's the result in fifty days nurses that he has done. So it is not you. You don't have a proof system when it comes to Ebola because the incubation period, as we all know, runs between two days to twenty-one days. That means that somebody could have gotten a cold and twenty, maybe let's say even a day or two afterwards, travel to Ghana. There is no way you can pick up such an individual. And so at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense at all. In fact, you can only screen people who are sick, and we can only hope because as much as we say that we are ready. I am sure you know that we are not fully ready because even the treatment center, how long did it take us to build one? Mm. And the capacity of that treatment center is not even up to 20. So that one in Tema, and we don't, the one in Kumasi, the one in Tamale is not even ready. A lot of hospitals, even as we speak, still don't have isolation centers. Mm. And so I don't think that we should, we should even dream about hosting the cup of nations. There is something that we call stupidity, and I don't believe that. Ghana is so stupid that we will do this. Because look, it's a disease that has no treatment. You can only manage the people and then hope and pray that their immune system kicks in and takes care of the mm. disease. And if advanced countries like the United States, even they are thinking of stopping every single flight from West Africa. And then Ghana decides that with our health system, we decide that we want to invite Ebola into our country. Is that what we want to do? Mm. The, I, I don't. I don't think that they are considering it. In fact, even economically, it doesn't make sense. Mm. But, but we, 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 people get sick. Mm. What, what, your economy will crash. We, we had a, we had a qualifier with Guinea uh, over the weekend, uh, within this week rather, not not over the weekend. And we we had some Guineans coming in. Guinea is one of the affected countries. How, how did the GMA feel about that? Well, I'm sure. I mean, it, indeed, I had the opportunity to speak on this, and I indicated that there is a need for us to screen everybody who comes in, even including our players, to ensure that as they are coming into the country, because the first league had already been played in Morocco. As they come in, they, they, they are not coming in with any fevers or anything like that. And if you remember, WHO issued an alert. To Absolutely. That even we should not our women should be careful sleeping with this um, individual. Mm. Because even if somebody recovers from the virus, he recovers from the disease, it takes up to six to eight weeks for the virus to get out of his semen. That means that if he sleeps with you even after recovery, within a month, he can still infect you. So that was one warning that WHO issued to us. So, and um, uh, I am sure we did screen them, and I'm sure that we probably thought that our contact time with them was just going to be our 24 hours or so, after which they'll go back to their country and hopefully mm. nobody will fall sick here. Because usually it is when they start showing signs and symptoms that they are highly infectious. I, and so, um, I, I, it is just... All right. Yes, please, I, I, I remember also that uh, there were a lot of complaints about uh, PPEs, personal protective uh, equipment. Yeah. Uh, we, had, we had a huge issue of unavailability on our medical fronts. How has that improved, especially coming on the back of the fact that we, 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 seem, we may have exposed ourselves? Well, um, I will say that at least um, since we started talking, 9,000 PPEs were made available to the various, uh, to Ghana, and then has been shared uh, among the various facilities in the district. But the problem with PPEs is that really, um, one patient alone can consume a lot of PPEs. What it means is every single health worker who attends to that patient should be in a PPE. And um, when you, the laborer who will clean to be in a PPE, the nurse who will be there will be in a PPE, anybody at all who goes close to the patient should be in a PPE. And the PPE, you can't wear it the whole day. So it means that uh, every shift, they will wear new PPEs. And as you go out, you have to take off your PPE. And that PPE cannot be worn again. It has to be disposed of. Mm. So the issue is that 5,000, even though it sounds a lot, if it's not enough, if you should start getting even two, three cases. What we are saying is that the chance of providing more PPE should be open. So that in case cases start coming in, we can actually have access to them. But 
the problem is you don't even want a case to come in. And if the case comes in, what you want to do is that immediately pick up the case, make sure that you isolate the patient, and then follow up all the people who have been exposed and quickly make sure that at least they are quarantined. And then limited movement is the key here so that you can hold and not allow mm. the virus to get out of control. Indeed, if it gets out of control, even a million of people, a million PPEs will not be enough. So the whole issue of it is that you have to pick your test is as clear as possible, make sure that you quarantine it and then the treatment starts and then all the people who have been exposed or come in contact with the patient. Quickly, you make sure that you follow them up. And, and, and even there. even with the PPEs, I, I mean, we, we have heard of the story of the nurse who treated Duncan, who it's unclear how she, she still got the, the virus, uh, it, it, even after she had done her PPE all right. It, it means that our, our medical workers are at risk. You've seen the case of Liberia, over 95 health workers have have got the, the virus anyway. It brings to mind uh, the earlier demands from uh, the, the GMA for, its, for, for frontline health workers in the case of, of in any outbreak in the country. You had asked for insurance, which is what the Liberian health workers asked for a few weeks ago. How has that conversation gone down? Uh, thank you very much. I mean, the, the PPE, as you rightly indicated, even the the technique of wearing and taking them off is a complex thing. And so it is important that that is the reason why we still feel that the system is not ready. Because by now, we should by now be simulating the system as if we are creating scenarios that there is a case. And then we organize drills and see how we wear PPEs, how we dispose them off, how we take them off and all those things. So that at the end of the day, there will be no last test or whatsoever when there is a case. So it is, that is something that by now we should have gotten to the level of doing drills just like doing fire drills. Mm. We have not even started there. We are not there yet because I'm trying the treatment centers. We all of them are not ready. It comes to the issue of the insurance. Actually, we have had a lot of discussions. We've written a lot of proposals to government and stuff like that, even though they have not engaged us in any discussions. But we even believe now that the issue goes beyond the frontline workers because, look, nobody knows where the first case we picked up from. It means that it could be somewhere in any village close to the border, or it could be somewhere in a village in Accra or Kumasi or whatever, and not necessarily compared to your colleagues. So before the frontline health workers come to even attend to the case, somebody may have been exposed. And so what we are saying is that I, we believe that government should take this opportunity and ensure that health workers who have been working in this country all these years without any proper condition of service, government should take the opportunity and put in a condition of service for the doctors and the nurses and the workers who work in the hospital, the pharmacists and all the laborers, everybody. Because, look, I believe that a lot of Ghanaians will not take appointments when they don't have any condition of service. But that's the situation we are in. Mm. And that is the reason why every time you hear that doctors, nurses, and everybody is going on strike for salary. Because mm. salaries are the only conditions of service that we have. Dr. Dr. Shibro, I'm just, so, just going to have you hold the line at this point. We'll come back to the conversation. But let's listen to uh, former United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan, who said he is bitterly disappointed with the international community's response. Kofi Annan said richer countries should have moved faster to deal with the outbreak. I myself have been bitterly disappointed by the response, and Messas Sans Frontier were right to raise the alarm, but I suspect. We tend to repeat our experience. When Ebola is not new. It was, it was discovered 40 years ago. And then it was dealt with in the Congo and other places. And so perhaps the health workers in these countries thought it, it's something that can be contained and that was not going to spread. So I'm, I'm disappointed, first of all, with the international community for not moving faster. Because we are, we are in this world, in this world, we are in it together. We saw what happened with SARS. Within 12 hours, it, was, it had crossed the oceans and from Asia to Canada. I, I point the finger of blame at the, at, the, at the governments with capacity. For example, I, the statement I issued earlier in the crisis indicated that it would be good if we can send formed units to these places who can hit the ground running, help set up field hospitals, 
for us to be able to contain the crisis. Because when you hear that in a city like Monrovia, there wasn't even a single bed for a patient with Ebola, then you realize how desperate the situations are. And I think there's enough blame to go around. Uh, the African governments and the countries in the region themselves could have done a bit more. Uh, they could have uh, asked for help much faster. And I think the international community could have offered and organized ourselves uh, in a much better way to offer the assistance. We didn't need to take months. So that was former US Secretary, UN rather, Secretary General Kofi Annan. Dr. Sherbo is still over the telephone. He's General Secretary for the Ghana Medical Association. Dr. Sherbo, I'm, I'm sure you had him. Just a quick comment on that. Um, I actually couldn't pick up the sound bite, um, mm. but at least I, 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 I heard what you indicated that he was talking about the slow reaction of the international community Absol to the affected countries. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think I share his sentiment um, because initially everybody thought that Ebola is an African problem mm. or a West African problem, and um, and they thought that um, their response could be, I mean, just like every day, every time. Um, West African problem. Suddenly, we have cases in Spain and the uh, U.S., and now everybody's attention has come to the fact that we are living in a global village, and as a result, you can't say that it's a West African problem. And so, I, I think that, well, it's a wake up uh, call, and I think that even though the international community has not been that swift in their, um, in their quest to help um, the affected countries, I believe now that cases have started being recorded in those countries, and now they have their no more staff are following up people who they suspect have been exposed. They will begin to pay attention and then we can all do what we can to ensure that mm -hmm. at least we control the outbreak in those major three countries, Liberia, Leone, and then uh, Guinea, mm -hmm. and also protect the other countries who have not been yet been affected so that they, 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 the disease doesn't get there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think we should also learn a lot of um, the, the example from Nigeria, mm -hmm. what they did to ensure that they were able to contain uh, the, the disease. And so it's, it's something that I think the international community uh, should be alive to now. And I'm sure right now the ASEOS has been making sure that the disease doesn't spread any further. Uh, even though the, the, the picture that is painted by the WHO doesn't look very bright because they are looking at the doubling time of the disease before we, and it doesn't seem like it is abating. Mm. And they are making projections that even by December, we should have about 1.5 million cases in West Africa, and that that is a, a very serious concern. Yeah, very so, scary, very yeah. scary. So Let, let's come back to the Ghanaian case, though. Let, let's yeah. come back to the Ghanaian situation. Yes, How um, important are the drills to you? Well, the, 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 the issue is that because we, it's not an everyday thing that we do, you mm. know that even for these countries like United States, where they usually prepare for biohazards and these dangerous viruses and stuff like that, um, they are having issues with breaching protocol. So if um, you are learning something for the first time, and um, you, you, after you have learned it, and um, you don't put it into practice, and you allow it to go still, the day that you be called on, there is the likelihood that there will be some mistakes. And it is the reason why even fire drills are carried out. It is not because that when there is fire, nobody will know that there is fire. Everybody will know there is fire, but how do you behave? when the, drug, the, the fire alarm goes off. And so that at the end of the day, we can have a smooth system. And because it's not the everyday disease that we see, and the CPE, the way to wear it, the way to take it off, is so, so critical. It is important that we organize these drills from time to time so that the training, people can remind themselves of the training. And one thing is that any mistake from one member of the team can endanger the whole team on the ship. Just one mistake by one member of the team can endanger the whole team. So it is important that the team works in concert. And so I think it means that when you organize the drills, you can see the loopholes, where people are portrayed, mm. where you need to come out, where you need to improve, mm. so that then you can make the system very tight mm. to ensure that at least you reduce the mistakes to the barest minimum. Mm. But if you train people and just let them go home and then they stay home for one month, two months, and suddenly you call them one day that there is a case, they should come in, what it means is that there is a propensity that people will make mistakes. And these mistakes, as far as Ebola is concerned, could cost forgiving. lives. And so that, that is the reason why I feel that by now we, have, we should have gotten to the stage where 
We are mm. rather organizing drills and getting mm. ourselves in readiness to ensure that as and when the disease comes, at least there will be uh, the, the movement will be flawless. Everybody mm. will be safe. Mm. And that is the it, reason why. Is, that, is there anything the association can do for itself in that regard? Um, interestingly, we have organized some trainings. We are still planning to organize more trainings mm. and stuff like that. But you know, all these trainings come down with money. And the GMA, as you know, is a non profit making organization. Mm. The money we need, we have. We did a small, small deal that we have. We thought that the government or the president had voted for. I think we've lost Dr. Shrebo there. We'll, we'll get him back over the phone and then listen to his submission on what the Ghana Medical Association is doing for itself in terms of preparing uh, health workers for any eventual uh, uh, outbreak or first infection of Ebola in the country. We'll also find out the assessment of awareness creation here in the country. I'm not sure if I know of any Ebola hotline. If you do, you can share it with me on our social media platform. Join us on TV, on Facebook. Now, we have also told you over time in a lot of our conversation how the, the Ebola as, as, as a, an epidemic could have grave consequences for businesses in West Africa. So here's what some businesses are doing. They are repositioning themselves to reassure the public that indeed they, they can have confidence in them to patronize their, their businesses. Most affected businesses in this uh, in, in, in this circle is the hospitality business. Now, what we're going to do now on is uh, every Friday, we look at those businesses that are repositioning themselves. We started with the Alisa Hotels, and you won't believe how it is redesigning, reinventing itself to suit the times we live in. When I come back, don't go away.